This is Duke University. Well, good evening, and welcome to another exciting edition of the Fuqua Distinguished Speaker Series. Today, I have the privilege of introducing Mary Barra, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of General Motors Company. Mary has served as CEO of GM since 2014 and was elected Chairman of the Board of Directors in January of this year. Under Mary's leadership, GM has experienced impressive top-line growth and record-setting profits. Prior to being named CEO, Mary served as an Executive Vice President for GM and a Senior Vice President of Global Product Development since 2011. In these roles, she was responsible for the design, engineering, program management, and quality of GM vehicles around the world. She began her career with GM in 1980 as a General Motors Institute co-op student at the Pontiac Motor Division. She graduated with a degree in electrical engineering and later earned her MBA from Stanford. This year, Forbes named Ms. Barra the world's most powerful woman in business and Fortune Magazine gave her the same title for the second year in a row. In 2014, she was named to Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people in the world. And she is truly passionate about the product that her company produces. Perhaps most impressively, she has owned multiple generations of Chevrolet Camaro sports cars. <laughs> Please join me in giving Mary a warm welcome. So Mary, it's absolutely fantastic to have you here and that you've set aside that Stanford thing uh, and, <laughs> and joined us here. Um, so you, you, have, you have GM in your blood. Your, your father worked for 39 years as a dye maker for Pontiac, I think. Yes. And, uh, and then, uh, as was mentioned, when you went off to college, you went to what was then General Motors Institute. So I'm wondering, every night when you, you had dinner, was he like telling you, you, you need to go work for GM. You know, this is your destiny. Did, did he work that hard, or? No, I think though. But I think um, he would bring. He would talk about work. He would bring home cars. At that point in time, they'd let employees sometimes bring home a brand new vehicle, and you know, the whole neighborhood would come over when he did that. And we, my brother and I, would climb through the car and learn every piece of it. And. It, you know, it was something that was very interesting. And that, that was the time when you went to a dealership well before your time that, you know, they paper the windows before the new car came out because they came out every year. And so it was just, you know, like early exposure and would get really excited about cars. Yeah. So uh, as I understand it, the, the first, uh, your first love was a Camaro. Yes. And uh, I'm curious, is that still your, is that your, you know, your, your true love or have you moved on in some way to? <laughs> Well, it's hard because, and, and I, 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 I really mean this. I mean, every, uh, I think it's because I had an opportunity in product development for a while, but I feel like every one of our products has a special place in the portfolio. I still have a, a you know, a, a passion for Camaros, but I have to admit that that Corvette out front is starting to edge it in a little bit. Um, but, but also, you know, just uh, had just stopped uh, or rotated out of driving our Cadillac CT6, which is one of the most technologically sophisticated cars we've ever put on the road. And so, one of the benefits of working for a car company is you get to experience a lot of our vehicles. So, um, they all have a special place. Yeah. I'll just mention that, that I told Mary I saw a lot of people taking pictures of the cars out front, but that people were really just waiting for the raffle. Uh, uh, and, and, and I she, said, oops. And, yeah. <laughs> she basically said, too bad. Uh, but anyway, so, so you have not been at, at GM as long as your father, but you, you basically, you, you've spent your entire career there. That's incredibly unusual. And so I'm curious, was there ever a moment in time when you came close to leaving? Uh, you know, I have had uh, a wonderful c career at General Motors because, and I've worked in so many different functions. So I, I think when I look back at my career, I worked for a lot of great leaders who really challenged me and gave me great opportunities. So uh, of course it was difficult as we went through the bankruptcy and the restructuring and there, there were moments where you you know, question yourself of, is this, you know, is this the right decision for me? But at that point, I'd been at General Motors for almost 25 years, and I knew what the company was capable of. I knew it had great people. And so I wanted to be a part, uh, and I had no idea I'd be in this role, but I just wanted to be a part of the team that helped, you know, GM recover and be the company that I know it can be. And I'm proud of the progress we're making, but we still have work to do. So 
you know, again, when you, you know, sometimes you, you do that soul searching of what, what is really important to me. And General Motors is very important to me. We, you know, we employ 220,000 people around the world. We bring uh, products to market that give people freedom. And so, um, you know, of course, there's, there were minutes during that time, but um, I knew where my heart was. Yeah. So you, you were named uh, CEO a little less than three years ago, almost three years now. And uh, I, I've seen where you wrote that you were really taken aback when you were named CEO because there was so much focus on the idea that you were the first woman to become the CEO of an automotive company. Um, and, and part of what you wrote was you felt like, well, these are, you know, people are getting all worked up about this because these are outdated perceptions. But, but were they really outdated perceptions in the sense of it has been a male-dominated industry for, for a long, long time? And so I'm curious about, did you find the role models and the mentors as you were making progress through your career? How, how did that work for you? Absolutely. And, and one of the things I say is I wouldn't be sitting here in this role if there hadn't been great mentors 20 years ago that were committed to diversity, that were committed to developing people and having a, a very inclusive and diverse environment. And when I look at the company now, uh, you know, our head of audit, our head of uh, North, North America manufacturing and global manufacturing, uh, our head of uh, marketing in Europe. I mean, I can go on and on with the list of women who are in very significant roles. I mean, in fact, the chief engineer of the Bolt EV that is out in front is a woman. Um, and so, and, and to get to those positions, that, that started 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the best kept secrets about General Motors of how, how uh, inclusive and diverse we are and how it's welcomed. Um, so uh, that did surprise me. And it also surprised me because there's so many women in very significant roles, whether you know, in governments, running countries, or in other significant corporations. Uh, but I think it was this outdated view of the auto industry, or at least of General Motors. Mm -hmm. So did you, to, to focus on this gender issue just a little bit, were the mentors and the people who were so instrumental in helping you progress through your career, were they men, women, a mix? It was a mixture. It was a mixture. I mean, clearly, um, you know, I, I started in 1980. Uh, so as I started my co-oping at General Motors Institute, so there were many men who were mentors, but also I would say women um, in, in various different parts of the corporation that had it, you know, made it part of their role to mentor women and to, and to, and to mentor men and women for that matter. But so I, I think that's something that has been very strong at the company for a long period of time. And we have formal mentoring programs as well as, uh, you know, there's also, I say, sponsorship of when you do a great job for someone, they're willing to say, hey, let's put this person in this role because they've done a great job here. Mm -hmm. So I think you earn some of that in your career as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So were there ever moments where you felt like, because of your gender, you were you were not being given the same opportunities, or that that people were not treating you with the same level of respect that that they might give to a man. You know, I, I would say, uh, of course, there there was times it was a benefit. There was times where maybe it was a detriment. But I think overall, it balances out. And I think that's an issue. That's not an issue for women or uh, you know any diversity group. That's just life. I mean, there's times where you know your what you bring forward is going to be viewed more positively, and there's times where it's not. So that's the way yeah, I look at it. Which, which is a which is a great way to look at it. So the, the I guess to help the audience mm -hmm. because they're going to be moving through these careers. What do you do when when someone treats you that way that that you feel like they are they're limiting you? They're keeping you on the sidelines in some way relative to what you could provide in terms of talent. Well, I think, first of all, assume goodness. Assume if somebody says something or does something that you say, wow, that, that I, I, if I choose to, I can interpret that and I can get really angry about that and I can be, wow, they don't, they don't value a woman or they don't value this or they don't value that. And so my first is to, it's kind of to assess intent. Because sometimes pe we all come from a different background and we have different learning and different perceptions. So it may just be that you know they have a perception and and, and it's not it's not personal. It's not about me. So I think then often there's an opportunity to have a conversation. Um, you know there are times where you have to stand up for yourself and go have that conversation that you may think is a little difficult, but. Um, and, and so you have to do that. And, and I think having a great relationship with mentors or with your supervisor that you can say, hey, you know, I understand this opportunity is available. Am I in consideration? If not, why not? And sometimes 
you may think you are, but you get an answer where you know you really do need to do some other things. Sometimes it's like, hey, you know what? I didn't think you were interested. So I think you have to be your own advocate. But I think it starts with, um, you know, a lot of times it's it, there's a uh, there's something that you can perceive as negative, and it really it's a conversation, a way of of really getting to understanding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So after, um, after getting uh, all this attention around being the first woman in this role, it was not that much longer that all of a sudden you're in the public eye in a very different way around the ignition switch um, issues. And, and, and you know, next thing you know, you're testifying in front of Congress and so on and so forth. But, but overall, you came into that like almost immediately. It, it, at the beginning of your tenure as CEO, and you were given enormous credit for having handled that crisis in a very, very positive way. Can you, can you help us understand what you were thinking? Because crisis is just a way of life. It, they, they will happen. Mm -hmm. So how did you unpack that crisis in a way that ultimately you were given all the, all, all the kind of congratulations on having done such a nice job? Well, I think first it, it started, we had a great team. And uh, so there was a, a handful of us that said, okay, we've got to, and, and, and the one thing about a crisis is, the day one, you don't know everything that's going to happen. So you, you know, it comes to you in bits and pieces um, as, as the story unfolds and as you learn. And most people think, okay, it happened and you know everything and then what are you going to do? But you don't. Uh, so we had a small group of people um, and we met every day. And, but we were focused the year prior, um, a, a subset of us in the company had worked on what, what should the values of the company be. And we had values and they were fine, you know, teamwork, innovation, continuous improvement, but they were something that you could say about any company. And so, um, and actually Mark Royce, who is here, who's a, a graduate of Fuqua, uh, uh, we were able, we were working on what is really going to differentiate General Motors. And so it was around customer, it was around relationships, and it was around excellence. And so as, and it's easy to say those things and it's easy to, to work on those when things are going well. But we really used that as an opportunity to live those values when, thing, when it was hard, when, there were, you know, when we were facing pretty severe challenges. But putting the customer in the center, saying we were sorry, being transparent and, and committing that we were gonna do everything in our power to make sure it never happened again, that's what guided us through the entire crisis and as we learned and, and we adjusted. And you know, I'm really proud of the entire team and I also think it was so important for our workforce because your employees are wondering what's going on, what's gonna happen, and it was very important that we, we communicated regularly to our employees to let them know what was going on and they rallied behind us and I really think it cemented our values into the company uh, because they saw we were serious and we were gonna live them even when it was hard. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you did was that, that you were extremely transparent and you, and you owned up to the, the, the mistakes that had been made. Um, at the same time, you said, we need time to, to make this right. Um, do you feel like because you had that transparency that people were willing to give you the time to make it right? You know, I think in the early days, in the first round of Congress, I don't think anyone was being too generous with giving us time, but... <laughs> But we needed the time. I mean, had I answered the questions I was asked in the first round of Congress, I would have answered them incorrectly. And so, you know, I think that is something that it, you, you need to make sure you're guided by facts and the truth. And you want to do that as quickly as possible, but you don't want to rush it because, you know, if you're really in a difficult situation trying to, to build trust and, and be transparent, it has to be fact-based. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, as we went through that, and, and the other thing I would say in business today if any company thinks that they can have this problem and kind of keep it over here, it's somewhat delusional. Um, you know, you're, you, to solve problems, you know, enough people are going to be aware of them, but you have to be transparent. And frankly, you know, your employees want you to be transparent. So I think, um, and, and with just today's age, the way things move and 24 hour news on everything, um, I, I really think it's the only pathway. And, and frankly, I think it's the, it's the fastest pathway to correct a situation. Yeah. You may not want to touch this question, um, but uh, when Volkswagen was having their difficulties, uh, did they reach out to say, can we get some advice about how we handle a crisis? I'm, I'm kind of guessing not, but... Uh... They, they didn't, um, uh, at least to me. Um, but, in, but in fairness, the other thing, um, 
because I, I learned, because when we were going through the, our, you know, the ignition switch issue, there was a lot of things written in the paper that weren't factual. Uh, and so right now, the only thing I know about the VW situation is what's been written in the papers. I mean, I think certain things are coming out as, as, as they go through the, the, legisl or the, the, the regulatory legislative um, system. But uh, so I, I, I tried to take a pause because knowing that sometimes what you, know, you read in the paper isn't always exactly correct or sometimes is, is, is not even close to the truth, that you, um, it's best not to comment on things you don't have the facts. Yeah. So, uh, so the, the, the reality is that, that there was enormous amount of negative publicity which, which uh, eventually dissipated because of the transparency. Um, but, but this is a more general issue for the business community, which is the, the, the reality that politicians want to get in the game and, uh, and say you're, you're doing something wrong, um, and the reality that there has been a breakdown of trust with, uh, with customers, with society. And so in your role as CEO, what, what are, you, are you thinking about that? What are you doing about that in terms of uh, rebuilding the, the trust that's so important to, to sustain your brand over time? Well, I, I completely agree with you, and, and brands are so important, and that's one thing at the company we're, we're making a big investment in of, of building our brands, but building it based on substance, starting with having great cars, trucks, and crossovers, starting with having a good relationship when you interact with the company, when you interact with our dealers, because they're, they're our face. Of, of the company, and it, it's 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 every one of the things in, in our value of customer is every interaction matters, and if you really put the customer at the center and you look at because what I find with most customers, I mean we you know a, a, a car truck or crossover has about thirty thousand parts that are integrated with millions and millions of lines of software, and we have rigorous validation processes, um, and, and they're improving as we really um, uh, you know, work to be industry leaders in having a systems approach to how we put cars in the road, on the road. But if something happens, a customer, A, wants you to care, wants you, wants you to listen, wants you to care, and would like you to fix it. And it's really that easy. If you listen, you care, and you fix it. They will be your, you know, your best advocate. I, one of the stories I tell is in the early days of the ignition switch. One of the things we said, we had done extensive testing. And we knew the vehicles were safe to drive if you just use the key or a key with just a ring. But we said to uh, to customers, if you are uncomfortable, we will give you a loaner. And um, so in the early days, you know, getting that situated where communicating to all of our dealers, making sure they knew, and getting the loaners. I had a, a customer who was very upset, said, you know, you, you said um, I, could, I could get a loaner. I went to my dealer. They said they don't have one. You know, and, uh, and so he sent me a note saying, you know, I, it was, and it was kind of personal. It was like, and I hate you, and I'm never going to buy a General Motors product again. It, it wasn't exactly that, but that was the tone. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so I said, of course, it was on a Friday afternoon. And I went, OK. And so I, I called my head of customer service. We, you know, and, I, and I sent the note. I sent a note back to him. Because other than email, I didn't know how to get a hold of him. I said, could I, could I call you? Would, you? would you be willing to share your phone number? And could I give you a call? So a minute or two later, I get the phone number. I pick up the phone. I call him. I listen. And I said, you know what? Um, you know, this is it's early days in getting loaners. I'm sure there was a misunderstanding. Would you give me a chance to work on this? And I immediately called Alicia Bowler Davis, our head of customer care at that time. And by the next morning, we had a car for him. And the next week, I got this note. I can't believe you cared. I can't believe you talked to me. And I can't believe the next day I had a, I had a loaner. And so, and you know, said. This is, you know, this is a company I wanted to be, want to be associated with. And so, again, it's every interaction does matter. And I think doing the right things, you know, putting technologic, technologically leading vehicles in, and services and providing that value to customers, but then if something happens, dealing with it and standing up, I think that's the only way to build, build, rebuild trust. And then I think from a corporate perspective, it's being a good corporate citizen. It's being involved in the communities in which we live and work. Uh, and investing what's important to help that community prosper. You know, we're in an industry where, um, you know, our industry once meant freedom, and it still does, but it's also associated with environmental concerns and congestion and safety. How do we lead through that and find solutions where people still have freedom, 
of, of mobility, but you know, be very responsible on the leading edge of dealing with those issues uh, because they have to be dealt with and we're probably in one of the best positions to do that. And that's what we see our role at General Motors. It's, it's redefining personal mobility, but doing it in a very responsible way for society in general. Mm -hmm. So clearly you're, you're doing so many things right because despite the, host, the, the hostility between politicians and, and the business community, um, in WikiLeaks it, it showed up that you were a potential vice presidential candidate. <laughs> and so, um, so should we be expecting you to make the move into the political world soon? I uh, have a full-time job that I love and am fully dedicated to uh, staying at General Motors. Okay. And, uh, and, you, and you have some challenges. So let's, let's switch to the, um, some of the challenges that you now have. And one challenge is that, that despite all of the, all of the numbers that, that were referenced in your introduction, that you know, great profits and so on, the stock price hasn't responded right. in the same way. And, uh, and I know that, that that has to be frustrating. But I imagine that what's happening is people are looking at the shift in the competitive landscape where it's no longer just Ford and Toyota and BMW and so on you're competing with, but you're competing with these Silicon Valley firms. And, uh, and, and you're competing kind of these new things where you're, you have to worry about the, the transition to electric cars, to autonomous cars, and car ride sharing. In all those things, you said that the one that worries you the most is the car and ride sharing. And, uh, and can, you, can you explain why that's the one that worries you the most? Well, I, I, I see all of them. I mean, definitely our industry is transforming. And so as a, as a company who's been in this business for you know, a, a, over 100 years, we can either lead the transformation or we can be disrupted. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate right now with ride sharing of whether it will be, um, it'll increase cars or decrease cars. And for as many uh, external reports that say it will decrease the amount of cars, there's others that say it will increase. So we don't know. But what we do know, when, when I look at sharing, and we have our own company, Maven, as well as a alliance with Lyft. So, so ride Lyft, okay, not Uber. <laughs> um, that, um, but, but we, again, if you put the customer in the center, and if you're in, for instance, New York City, it's expensive to own a car. You, you know, where are you going to uh, park it? And that's expensive as well. As well as once you get the car out and you're going from point A to point B in the, in the city, it's not like you're gonna enjoy the thrill of the road because you're in bumper to bumper traffic. So, and then when you get to where you're going, if there's a place to park, that might be expensive as well. So if you look at it from a customer pain point perspective, there are certain um, applications where ride sharing or car sharing makes a lot of sense because you eliminate those pain points. There's other, when you look at our business though, you know, we're extremely strong um, in the middle of the company with crossovers and SUVs. That will be one of the last areas disrupted by sharing because sharing makes the most sense from a, eliminating pain points in dense urban areas. That's an opportunity for General Motors because that's where our share isn't as high as it is in other areas. So we see it as you know, very much changing potentially the way people get from point A to point B, but is an opportunity for us and, and really something that's additive to our business. As well as, you know, when, just to cover quickly, the you know, looking at electrification, we're so proud of the Bolt EV and being able to put a car out, on, out in the road yet this year that's affordable and has a range of 238 miles, which really eliminates range anxiety for most people. And you know, that's building on our second generation Volt, and we have more to come from an electrification perspective. So I, again, very excited about that piece of it, as well as connectivity. General Motors has had the co a connected car for 20 years with OnStar, you know, right now in the marketplace, we have, uh, by the end of the year, we'll have 12 million vehicles on four continents connected. And think about, you know, how many of you, if, uh, when you're going to class or going to work, if you realize you forgot your phone, will turn around and go back? Most of you. Well, imagine, because we want that, can you work? We're addicted to that connectivity. We want it all the time, but how do we integrate that into the vehicle, do that in a seamless way so you're safe, you're not distracted? 
that's something we've been working on and building on, on the OnStar. So I see connectivity, electrification, and then autonomous. Um, autonomous has been uh, something where we can leverage the deep technical capabilities of the company, but then there was one area where we didn't have it. So we acquired Cruise Automation, a startup, and that's been actually a lot of fun to work with this 40-person startup that's now uh, over 100 uh, people that are still functioning in, you know, in a startup environment, but have the strength of you know, the 220,000 men and women of General Motors behind them to move fast. And so we're excited about that as well. So we, I see it as an obligation. I think the, our leadership team, we, we look at it and say, we hold ourselves accountable to lead in this transformation and do it responsibly. So it's, ex it's incredibly exciting. Because at the same time we're doing that, we're, we're working on great cars like the Corvette or, or you know, the Silverado. And so you know, it's, it's just a very dynamic business right now. So I find it exciting. And just last comment on the stock price. Uh, you know, there's a lot of issues about the industry. And is this as good as it gets? Are we at peak? Are we going to enter a cycle? No one knows. We've looked back for the last 60 years. Every single downturn we've had has, has not been predicted. So we're prepared, though, because we know we're a cyclical business and we're being very disciplined. But that's one of the issues that's just overriding the industry. But our, you know, every day we just say, you know, we're going to keep performing. We're going to keep making the company better. We're going to keep, uh, you know, making sure we have products and services and, and a customer experience that's uh, superior. That's what we're dedicated to do. And I believe the results will come. So. Um when you, when you made the observation about these, that there are these significant challenges, you, you actually said previously, I'm less worried about electrification and autonomous cars because those are technical challenges and, and we're all over it. We're really good in the technical space. But the ride sharing was more of a social relationship change mm -hmm. and, and that you, you weren't as confident mm -hmm. about the culture of GM being ready for that. So can you talk about sure. the, the, the need, your views around, you've been very open about the, the need for GM to change its culture. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say first, you know, uh, we do have you know, tremendous expertise from a technology perspective, but uh, on the software and on the services, that hasn't been our core. Uh, so we've brought in a lot of people who have that expertise, and across the company, nearly 40% uh, of, our, of our salaried workforce has been with the company less than five years. And that's because there's just you know, been kind of an evolution and change. It's, it's a surprising uh, fact for most people. And we're bringing in a lot of, we have a lot of people from Silicon Valley. We have a lot of people from, uh, from Canada. Some of the sources where Silicon Valley hires, we're hiring as well. And, and bringing people who have had experience in Silicon Valley to the company, you know, whether they stay in Silicon Valley or in Detroit or you know, we have locations around the world. And so we're infusing that talent because when you, when you look at something that's being disrupted from a, from a technology perspective, you have to make the decision, do I build it, buy it, or partner? And you, know, you can build things, but sometimes you have to look and say, but can I do it in the time frame I need to? Because done two years later is probably not going to work. Um, and that's you know, when you see us uh, creating uh, the Maven uh, organization within the company. And I believe 60% of those employees are, are from outside the company, most of them millennials. And so again, we've really looked at what are the skill sets we need to move fast and to win, whether we build partner or, or, or then you know, the alliance with Lyft. So you know, when I look at it, that's something different because it's a service business. But that's why we've brought in and attracted the talent and then partnered or purchased mm -hmm. as it made mm -hmm. sense. So you're not on the West Coast, but really you're a tech firm now. I'd like to think so. 30,000 parts integrated with a couple, several million lines of code. I don't know. It sounds techy to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so how uh, another shift ha has been, uh, you kind of observed to me earlier today that, that in Silicon Valley you have people who are partners in one space, competitors in another space. How, how does it feel to adjust to that as you are moving to that space to have Apple, for example, as a partner around CarPlay, at the same time, all of the kind of the, the rumors and so on that Apple wants to move directly into the, the auto space? Well, I think when we, I look at the tech companies that want to get into the auto space, I understand it because it's such a, it's such a dynamic and interesting and, you know, 
the product that we produce and put on the road is such a significant product. So I understand the interest. Uh, and, and I assume, you know, our assumption, we, we only know about Apple and Google and others, what we read in the paper, just like you, but our assumption is they're going to in some fashion. And so that's how we uh, attack the business and prepare. But to your point with, with Apple, we, you know, we work because we have the broadest uh, 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 implementation of Apple CarPlay in our vehicles in, in the United States and beyond. And so we are partnering here, and, and it is a new dynamic, which I think is, is you know, people are in the business school who are going to you know, be entering the business world. The, the days of, you know, here's my business and there's my competitors and never will never talk or meet or collaborate, it's just not the way of the world any longer. Um, you know, even with traditional companies, there's times where we're going to be more, cap uh, for instance, we do fill cell development with Honda because it's a, it's a capital intensive, it's an important technology, but that partnership and, and having a good working relationship yet you know, day to day in, in every city and, and area, we, we do compete. So I think it's finding you know, how you do that and how you, you know, separate parts of the business, but once you partner, you've gotta be all in on that. You can't go halfway or the partnership's not gonna succeed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, one, one other thing that you've been very clear about is this, and it relates to the issue that we talked about before, which is really restoring trust, and, and that historically there's been a social contract that, that business has felt this responsibility, not just to maximize shareholder value, but, but to, to use that business to improve lives. Mm -hmm. You've been very, very open about your desire to rebuild the community in Detroit. So can you talk about that? Well, it's our home. It's our global headquarters. And uh, you know, I think most people are aware that Detroit has had a, a very difficult situation. And so one of the things, though, as it went through its bankruptcy and restructuring that I'm most excited about now is business and the local government and the state government, we're all working together. Uh, and, and so there's enough work to do that we don't have to be working at cross purposes. At General Motors, we're very dedicated to the education system. First, we, you know, we believe in, in specifically in STEM uh, that with technology disrupting almost every industry, we need to have strong STEM resources uh, available uh, for all aspects of business. Uh, but also just you know, in the community being responsible that every child has the opportunity to get a great education um, and that people will want to go there because their children can get and live there and work there because they can get great educations. That, that's fundamental. And so, you know, we're working with the companies, you know, have a regular relationship with the, the local government, the state government. And, you know, it's going to take a while to, to really get the, the place, but I would say there's, there's a lot of positive uh, um, initiatives already underway. But the fact that we're all working together, I'm confident we're going to get it done. Mm -hmm. But we, we feel it is a, is a huge responsibility. Yeah. So uh, you, you once said, uh, as a kind of note to your younger self, uh, that the, the thing that you should be paying attention to is speed mm -hmm. and that time is your enemy. And so can you, can you tell people here who, again, are, are the younger selves right now, um, what does that mean? How, how do you take advantage of the time you have more effectively um, given this world where things are speeding up? I think the one thing is in a big company, you can sometimes get bogged down in making decisions. And you, I think realizing that every decision not made is a decision made. Because if you're trying to decide if I'm going to do something or not, and you keep putting off the decision, you've kind of made the not decision. And, uh, and so, you, want, you don't want to be reckless with your decision making, but you also you want to be data driven, but also realizing that there's many decisions you have to make where you don't have perfect data and you never will. And so one of the things we're really you know, driving in the company is speed. Um, you know, how can we move quickly? How can we reduce um, bureaucracy? And again, working with uh, cruise automation, you know, one of the things I've said as I've talked to them is, you know, don't accept if, if the company, because we show up and we want to help, and you know, we don't want to get in the way of that, um, that company working, but they've driven, I'd say, so many positive things into the company about moving with speed and what needs to be done in a meeting or what can just be done. And so we're constantly looking at that because, you know, being first is an advantage. And so that's what we're really driving, getting rid of the waste, making sure we move quickly. You know, our leadership team, we make sure that we don't want to gate decisions. I mean, there's many times where early, a global company, early in the morning or late at night, we're on the phone making a call so we don't stop anything. 
And I think the, just the mindset of knowing it, the longer you take to make a decision, again, you have to balance it of what data can you get and, and, and make be, be data driven. But if you just keep postponing something, you really have made a decision and generally isn't gonna move your company forward. Yeah. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a couple of more personal questions, and then uh, I'm going to turn it over to the audience to, to ask some questions. So back to your introduction where you're the, the most powerful woman in business and one of the 100 most influential people in the world and, and so on and so forth. I mean, those are incredible accolades. Do you, do you feel like with them comes a level of responsibility that you never asked for, that, that in other words, you've now become a role model for so many people in this room and elsewhere that, that, that that's become a part of your job in addition to uh, your, your day job of being CEO of, of, of GM. Well, one of the things I've learned is that you know, often people want to see people like them in a role um, to know that they have a chance of, of achieving it. And that was something you know, I, I guess somehow I didn't see and, and I've become much more aware of of, uh, you know, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, my daughter is now going to study engineering, uh, be, and, and you know, she, I'm sure it's not just because of the, the role I'm in, but that it contributed, and I think that's a positive thing. One of my passions is, is really encouraging young women to, to, to uh, pursue STEM fields. Uh, because I think it's so important. So I think from that level, yes, it does come with a responsibility, but you also have the opportunity to, to, be, to make an impact. And so that's, that's the way I look at it and see it. And so for the things I'm passionate about, uh, and because so many people helped me in my career, um, it's, you know, it's kind of a pay it forward and, and, and being able to give back, um, I think is very important. Okay. And then the, the last question for me, which is you're very active on social media. Uh, and did that just come naturally to you, or was this a real effort? Because you talked about the, the incredible transformation in terms of the workforce. Was this a way that you felt you could connect better to your employee base and customers and, and so on? Well, it actually happened because I had the opportunity to, to be in a couple of forums with Sheryl Sandberg, and she really encouraged me to, to post or to have a Facebook account. <laughs> and, uh, Surprise, yeah, yes. So, but, but I have to tell you, um, so I, I was a bit reluctant at the beginning because I, I, you know, I, I am a public figure, but I, I try to protect my personal life and my family. But um, so you know, my Facebook page is, and, and, and communicating on Twitter, though, have become extremely powerful to really communicate with employees and to really help people understand the company because there's a lot of dated views about General Motors. And so to really um, be able to communicate and be excited, you know, for me to be, the things I'm excited about to be able to share them and to see the passion coming from our employees is probably the, the most fun, but then also reaching others. So, you know, it, it has been a very positive experience and it's one now I've encouraged other uh, leaders to do because it is such a great way to, to talk, you know, to communicate about your company and to you make sure your employees know what you're thinking. And have you gotten any reverse mentoring from younger people uh, about how to use that platform effectively? Yes. <laughs> I'll leave it there. OK. <laughs> All right, let's turn it over to the audience. This question way in the back there. Thanks a lot for coming today. Uh, I thought your testimony before Congress was really powerful and impressive on a personal note. And I was wondering if you got any skepticism or criticism internally for the approach that you wanted to take. And if you did, how did you navigate those waters? Uh, well, I would say early on, you know, the foundational principles that I talked about is how we approached Congress. I mean, clearly, I needed to understand the, the, you know, the legal parts of that process. But you know, our legal team was very much you know, pushing of let's live our values and, and do, you know, do what is right. Uh, we did get a lot of criticism in the first round when I didn't answer a lot of questions because I simply didn't know. But I think as, as we came back as we said we would, and that, that was you know, pretty positive. So, but I think it was the tone, the team that was working on this set of, hey, we're going to be as transparent as possible. That's, that's what we did in Congress, understanding their rules. 
Hey, thank you so much for being here. My name is Liz. Um, I am curious actually about a different type of innovation than was discussed earlier. I think it's a sexy topic to talk about electric vehicles and automation, but there's an interesting trend from Tesla um, that's a business model innovation around direct sales to customers. And I'm, I'm curious, I mean, I think we're all familiar with like the used car salesman kind of trope, but I, there is some question as to how things are going to be going forward, and I'm wondering if that's something you're dealing with in the company and how you're moving forward from there. Well, we see our dealers as, as a very strong asset. Uh, and when you think about the technological sophistication of the vehicles, uh, which, is, which is only increasing, think about it is you know when you go to the Apple store and there's the the genius bar. I mean, we so when we look at our dealers and that have first of all a relationship with the community, a relationship with our customers, and then as we look at how things are going to be more complex, I would say even if you're driving a relatively new car from General Motors, um, you know the amount of technology that is on that vehicle, I bet you haven't even peeled the onion back one or two layers for what the car can actually do. So we see the dealerships as a partner in doing that and we'll transform together we already have I mean, right now, most dealers make the, um, just from coming in from a showroom, it used to be when you wanted to buy a new car, you went and bought, visited a lot. The average right now that people are visiting 1.4 dealerships as they, you know, when they make their decisions. So they're, they're doing their shopping online. Uh, they're, they're coming in saying, I want to buy this car with this deal with the, you know, and so it's already changed and our dealers are working. Our, most of our dealerships have business development centers where they're actively taking leads, reaching out to customers, uh, um, whether it's service, whether it's new vehicles. So our dealers are evolving with us and we see them as an asset with the relationships they have and the brick and mortar that they have in the, in, in the community to, to be that uh, place that helps us really convey the technology. Hi, my name is Hunter, I'm a second year here. Um, I had a question, a recent book that was recommended to me by my finance professor, Makers and Takers, describes some of the challenges contemporary CEOs face in regard to meeting the short-term interests of the finance industry and shareholders, which was broached earlier in the question about shareholder versus stakeholder value. I'm curious about how you're handling the simultaneous competing pressures of meeting those short-term goals of the marketplace while also investing in innovation that's gonna trans help you transform the automotive industry from transportation as a product to transportation as a service. Thank you. Sure. So, I mean, we're, we are a, we have to take a long-term view because a new product program is anywhere from three, four years plus, depending on how, you know, where we're starting from. And so, uh, you know, we can't have a quarterly focus. You know, we have to, to perform each quarter as it relates to how we do in the marketplace, but we very much take a long-term focus and are looking at creating long-term value. And I would say, you know, talk to many, many investors and that is clearly, you know, most, most of our investors will say, we want you to behave like you're a private company and you're investing for the long term. Uh, and if there's different decisions you're making because you're a public company, you've really got to examine that. So um, yes, you, you, know, you, you have to perform, but I think you also have to tell your story to understand the investments you're making. And again, things are going to go up and down. It's just, it's, it's a very volatile market right now, which I think is kind of going to be the continuing place. If you are convicted about your strategy, what you're doing, how you're going to create long-term sustainable value, I, I think that's the best path. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Vedant. I'm a second year here. Uh, you are the CEO of uh, GM, which is a company which is very global and has businesses that caters to a lot of different customers. And you've gone through some tough times recently. How, as a CEO, do you keep the culture constant across different countries and continents uh, when you're actually making your decisions? Well, I, I mean, we have a, a distributed leadership team. I mean, the top 13 people in the company, you know, they're, they're headquartered around the world. And I think that's one of General Motors' strengths is, unlike some other companies, we grew up as a collection, actually 100 years ago, when Billy Durant went around and bought a lot of companies and then put it together as General Motors. Um, so we have deep local knowledge and understanding in many of the markets that we compete. We are looking to say, where does it make sense for us to compete? Because uh, simply, you know, we can't be everywhere to everyone with everything. 
uh, especially when you look at the auto industry and some of the restrictions, and every country is a little different from a safety standards, from an emission standards, from a uh, what you have to produce in country. And so, you know, we've really worked hard over the last you know five six years to say where do we have a sustainable path to win, and then you know following the values we have for the company and, and having strong leadership that conveys that through the company. That, that's that's really the way we look at it. And it, it's it's important. We have in in the company of two hundred twenty thousand people we have the uh, our senior leadership group is 300 people and we get together twice a year to make sure we're aligned but then we also are leveraging technology telepresence other things and we're, we're connected much more often uh, to make sure if there's anything major that happens we're going to get everybody on telepresence or we're going to have a global town hall and talk to everyone uh, because you can't underestimate the power of, of communication and people understanding so they can be aligned <laughs> Hi, thanks for coming. My name is Abdullah. Um, you touched up a bit upon this, but um, it's often said that through difficult times we learn the most. And so you're at the company at a very difficult time that just didn't, didn't just have business pressures, but a lot of colleagues going under personal pressures too because of the situation in the company. I'm wondering, once you looked at the community and when you looked at the company internally too, what was your main takeaway um, about a situation like that? You mentioned that crises maybe are hard to predict, but can, is there something that can be done and what can you learn from it? Well, clearly I think there's so much that you can do uh, to uh, make sure the company is best prepared from a, you know, from a crisis perspective. One is having everybody understand the mission. Just an example, one of the things we did after we had the ignition switch recall, we put a program in called Speak Up for Safety because we really wanted every single employee to know if you see something that you're not sure it's right. Now, you know, if, if you're, you know, engineering this, and there's a guy across the aisle who, or, or that's that's working on it. Go talk to him. But if, if you know, beyond that, if you see something that you're worried about doesn't make sense, let us know. And you know, we've celebrated the program of of making sure people feel free to bring issues up. Um, having a strong um, compliance program and uh, you know a strong we call our code of conduct winning with integrity. And you know, there's not a, a message when we talk to employees that we don't talk about, yes, we've got to perform and here's the goals we've got to achieve, but we've got to do it the right way. We've got to do it with integrity. And I think so much of tone at the top and making sure that's what under, people are understand, that's what it is expected. And for the, you know, the very small, small, small percentage of people who don't, dealing with those people to make sure that everyone knows you're serious, I think is, is extremely important. Uh, and so I think there's a lot you can do to, to not just assume you're, you know, I assume we're going to be hit by cycles, but I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure I've got a culture. Because when, a, when a, something that becomes a crisis in its early days, it was generally solvable if it was brought forward. Uh, and so if we can get everyone saying, Here, here's the way we behave, here's our responsibility to the community, to the company, to our shareholders, and to ourselves, uh, and live those values, the issues that could grow into crises we can solve in, you know, as a matter of business. Hi, Mary. Uh, Dave Snow. I'm on the Board of Visitors. And, uh, you know, when I look at, you know, the autos, broadly speaking, before your arrival, one of the dimensions of difficulty that other industries don't have is the uh, United Auto Workers, the UAW. And historically, that's been a very difficult and complex management challenge um, at the leadership level, particularly within the UAW. But you seem to have you you seem to have done something special there. There's a much better, at least from the outside looking in, more cooperative relationship, and that's a real management coup if you can do that. And what was your secret? Or you've not. Am I not seeing it correctly? Well, so I, I would say, um, first of all, I think having a very um, open and honest and productive relationship with all your constituents, constituencies, unions being very important. Um, but I would say the foundation for that that was really laid in the late 90s. We had had a very devastating strike in 98. Um, and, and from that time, we had been building the relationship with the UAW. Clearly, it was, it was stressed when we went through bankruptcy where, you know, there were sacrifices made by everyone. But I think, you know, the foundation of having a, you know, 
eventually you're going to have to solve the issues. I mean, you know, I, I think I was proud of the fact that before our last negotiations, the head of the union, Dennis Williams, said, if we have a strike, I see that a failure on my part as well as management's part, because um, it, it causes so much disruption. And, you know, for any of you who have ever dealt with situations where you have strikes, if you can't resolve it at the table now, once, some, once you leave the table, it's a heck of a lot harder to get them back and to get resolution. It's usually both, both sides are going to suffer for that. And so, you know, do we have difficult times and difficult conversations? Absolutely. But we try to create an environment where put the issues on the table, because eventually we're going to have to solve them. So we might as well do it all along and not save them up for every four years or get to a crisis mode with them. And that, that's the mindset. But th that relationship and that foundation was really the, the, the bricks were put in place um, in the, you know, after the 98 strike. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Olden. I'm a first year MBA here. My question is, what impact do you think the outcome of the upcoming election will have on General Motors business? Well, we're a nonpartisan company. <laughs> And, but, but, you know, we work hard to have good relationships with all of the governments. You know, we participate in 130, or do business in 130 com countries around the world. We want to have a productive relationship with each of those um, governments. And so, you know, regardless who wins, we're going to, there's a lot of work to be done. You know, there's a lot of work to be done in the regulatory area of, of enabling the great technology that we can do with uh, autonomous and infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, I could go on and on. So we're ready to work with whoever is elected to, to, to really be solutions-based and let's move the country forward. Hi, thank you for being here. My name is Michelle Hardy, and I'm wondering, um, I, I do not own a Corvette, uh, but Darn. I know it's, <laughs> it's a very you know, distinct, visceral driving experience, and as autonomous cars uh, become more pervasive in the lineup, what happens to that distinct driving experience? What do you um, imagine is going to be the signature GM experience in a car where the customer is not touching the wheel? And then how do you anticipate that GM will lead the way in making that feel like a safe experience as well, given the, the data vulnerabilities that have been exposed? Well, one of the things we're working really hard on, even in today's cars, is to make sure we take cybersecurity. We have a chief cyber officer who's the single point where, and we've really worked hard to learn from other industries um, to make sure that we're uh, you know, in a very uh, positive position in that case, but uh, ever diligent, because that's never something that you say, check, got that done. It's something that you have to stay diligent on along, you know, so privacy as well as cyber. Um, but, you know, I, I think when you look at the, so, and so if you take that to, to the autonomous vehicle, that's where I think 100 years of experience of putting cars on the road and understanding how systems work together. Um, because right now is we, we actually have over 30 vehicles, autonomous vehicles driving with a AV trainer, we call them, um, in, in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, as well as San Francisco, learning experiences. Because it's not about miles. Miles is a piece of it, but it's really, um, as you drive, it's all the different things that happen that aren't normal course, and how, how does the vehicle learn to deal with all those things. And so that's what we're focused on. We're very much focused, you know, I, we've been very um, clear that we're not going to put autonomous vehicles out until uh, you know we have met the safety standards that we think are so important that is based on our learning once we get to autonomous we do believe for a very long period of time you know autonomous experience will be in a ride sharing because again it's removing those customer pain points that I talked about and um, and, and and that's an opportunity too to how do you design that autonomous vehicle to really enrich the person's experience um, as they're as they're being uh, you know transported from point A to point B but we also think um, that you know there's it's for a very very long time you know there'll be people driving cars Corvettes or driving trucks. I mean, look at, look across America. A lot of people, a truck is their you know is their livelihood. It's integral to their live, livelihood. And so, um, you know, understanding the customer experience in autonomous vehicle and ride sharing. Someday down much down the road, will you maybe have an autonomous vehicle in your driveway? Looking at how do the what's the customer experience when you own it. Um, you know, we're looking at all those things, but understanding um, you know there's a, there's a long ramp there from when you know there's not going to be a driver, but also why we work so much on the safety systems in a, in a driver-based vehicle. Because right now in the United States, last year there was about 34,000 fatalities. Um, over 90% of them, 95%, were um, human error. 
And so, and I would also say the biggest Pareto on that chart is, is wearing your belt. So, I mean, if any of you don't wear your safety belt, I mean, that's the number one way to not become part of that statistic is to wear your safety belt. But, um, you know, so we're continually working on how do we improve the safety there. And autonomous, though, done right, leads us to, you know, a, a very safe environment. So you're, you're not planning on having, like, sport or thrill mode in these autonomous cars uh, for the visceral experience? Well, you know, I mean, I would say as we, as we get to autonomous, you know, what's, what, what is the environment? I mean, that's one of the things where we know how to do um, uh, sport and uh, outrageous and, uh, and, and so safely. Uh, by the way, and so um, we will, you know, we'll continue to work on that because that's that's a huge, um, that's a cultural pri or you know value for us is we say safety and quality are foundational commitments, never compromise. So we're going to look to do that. But hey, we love to drive, so we're, gonna, we're I'm, I'm not ruling anything out. Uh, hello, my my name is Mitchell, uh, and I would, I, although I like the Camaro, I would side with the Corvette. <laughs> Um, uh, and a follow-up question to uh, self-driving cars. I think it's an inevitable part of our future, and uh, it, that brings a lot of ethical issues. So one of the ones I would pose is if I'm an owner of a vehicle and a child goes out in front of my vehicle, uh, it, there has to be a choice. Either I get in an accident with that individual or the car chooses to possibly uh, damage itself in avoiding that, that issue. Uh, and so I wonder how is GM going to position itself to address some of these ethical issues where your consumers might not agree on the decision structure of that AI system? Well, I, th I think um, there's a lot of learning as we get go through that that process of, of having the car learn of, you know, the speeds at which cars will first be are, are very slow speeds. So, you know, I think the major focus is, um, is being... Uh, making sure that we're being very conservative. And, you know, right now, if there's an issue, the car stops versus, you know, so I think this, it's, you know, tooling along at 80 miles an hour and all of a sudden there's a baby stroller in front of you um, is an interesting conversation. And I'm not saying that, that, you know, there's not going to be those issues that we have to work through, but I think there's a lot of learning that's going to happen on the road as we get there. Um, you know, sensor technology limits how fast the cars can go right now also, and, and we'll solve those issues. And as we solve those issues, I believe, you know, all of technology is going to move forward. And then I think we're going to have to be very transparent uh, about the vehicles because that, that decision is happening in, in a human's brain right now. Um, so I think there's a journey that we're going to go on as we work through those issues. But I think there's a lot of learning that can occur. We don't have to make that decision right now. There's a lot of learning that will occur. Good afternoon. Great to have you here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with the Duke community. Thank you. Um, I'm Joe Swedish. I'm uh, with the Board of Visitors. And I want to go from the technical to more the personal professional again. Um, there was a question put to you about uh, mentors, career progression, and so forth. But I'm wondering if you could reflect on kind of the career journey and the various inflection points that you experience so that you can give some insight to aspiring leaders here today what to expect, and maybe there's some uh, many similarities in terms of their pr uh, career progression that they will witness that you experience, and maybe you could give some guidance in terms of what they can expect as they move to new levels in their careers. Sure. Uh, you know, I would say the foundation, and this is what I learned from my parents um, who didn't have the opportunity to go to college, but their, their ethic, they you know, grew up during the Depression, and they had an extremely strong work ethic. And that is something that has always guided me. So, you know, um, work hard is number one. And, but follow your passion, because if you love what you do, the hard work that you put in is not going to be, you know, tor torturous. And so I think follow your passion, love what you do, you'll do it better. Um, and then, you know, there's no substitute for hard work. So I'd say that's point one. I would say the, the second is, um, you, you know, you've got, you've got to listen. And, you know, so much of that as you rise in your career of leading people is understanding people. And it's, it's about listening and, and valuing diversity um, and recognizing when you walk in the room, I, I heard a quote yesterday um, where it said, uh, you know, as, as a CEO walks into, this was referring to the board, they don't need to know the answer when they walk into the room, but they should be pretty sure that when they walk out, they have the best answer. And so it's, it's valuing your team. One of the things I look for is I want to have, uh, have constructive conflict and debate 
Uh, my team uh, right now at General Motors, 50% uh, of them have been with the company like me for 30 plus years. 50% have been with the company less than six years and come from other industries and other OEMs and, and have you know, very geographical diverse experiences. So when we get in a room, if we can really debate issues, I think we're gonna make a better decision. And so it's listening, it's valuing that kind of debate I think is, is very important. But as an individual, love what you do and then work really hard. And don't worry so much about, you know, you ought to understand your career path and, when, and, and be actively knowing what you want to accomplish. But do every job like you're gonna do it for the rest of your life. Because that kind of ownership of the job, you know, don't, you don't want to be renting the job, you want to be owning the job. Because when people see that kind of dedication and hard work, that's when you get noticed and that's when, you know, you're, you're being considered for additional responsibilities. So that would be just a, a handful of, of pieces of advice. Okay, uh, I know there are many more questions, but sadly we've, we've come to the end of our time. So Trey, do you want to? Yes, Mary, thank this? you again so much for coming today. Well, if I could just say thank you so much for this opportunity. It has just been a pleasure. I so much enjoy my time at Duke, so um, I really appreciate this opportunity. So thank you, Dean. Thank you.